Okay, this is for the first Lema for all the Cholim, Lord Israel, continuing with uh, Muktzah. Okay, Muktzah determined by lack of purpose. This relates to items which are not considered utensils and don't possess any inherent function or purpose for the, for the Sabbath day. Examples, broken glass, stone, stones, nutshells, eggshells, inedible peels, cobwebs, twigs, money, raw foods, unfit uh, for immediate consumption, money, and um, um, what's the other one? Um, old milk cartons. Okay. Such items will not be muktza if they are reserved before Shabbos, whether orally or not, for a permitted purpose. For example, a coin may be worn as jewelry or a stone used as a doorstop. Animals, however, are always muktza. Okay, let's uh, do the next one next time. Kevin, so what, about, uh, what about one's own animals? Then I don't, it doesn't say. You see, this book was written many years ago before that became a popular question. But and animals that are not yours are muktza, but it's challenging. You know my friend Effie? Yeah. The dog. Comes to me, the specific, uh, I know it's, if it's your own dog, you're allowed to, it's not muktza. Actually, but there are certain conditions, even when you hold it with the leash, because Hilton was looking after this dog, uh, and he was house sitting and on uh, someone else's dog, and he had to, he couldn't, he had to, he couldn't have any slack on the lead. He, um, it had to be taught. Yeah. Then it was, then it was, it was mutar. So there are, cert there are certain ways and means behind uh, to to put to patur it. Okay. But if it's your own dog, it's okay. Okay. Um, but maybe also, um, maybe also you have to, it has to be taught. They probably, uh, um, Allah, Allah is relating to that. All right. Uh, anything else you want to teach us? Um, no, there's, a, there's another section we'll do for on Monday. All right. All right. So, um, all right, guys, we're on 50A4. Basically, the Bryce discusses another case in which one digs in the public domain is exempt of liability. The rabbis taught in a Bryce, if one dug a pit and uncovered it, in other words, he left the little like the manhole and then gave it over to the public for them to use as a water cistern, he is exempt of liability for any damage it does. So what do you mean he dug a pit and he gave it over to the public as a water cistern? And why is he exempt? Well, very simply. So, you know, he decided to do a service to the community. So he either told the townspeople, um, you know, at what do you call it, a municipal public meeting, or uh, where, or he printed in the media, whatever the case is, we wrote a note on the notice board, or he spoke to the appropriate public officials. So if you speak to the public uh, officials, you don't have to speak to so many people. Otherwise, you've got to get the majority of the citizens' consent or other the public officials, which are less in number. So the statement is basically the pit that I dug is needed for you to gather rainwater, and the water is suitable for your animals to drink. I hereby grant it to you. So that's uh, Rashi's explanation, that he dug the pit especially for them to use in their service. So... Obviously, this only applies if the public actually needed the water cistern. Uh, and he has to have dug it in the right appropriate area. You can't dig it in the middle of the thoroughfare where it interferes, uh, where it interferes with traffic, guys. Where animals are walking mm. backwards and forwards, or it's going to be what you call an inconvenience. That you're not allowed to do. You have to have it in an appropriate area, which is not going to disturb people and is actually going to be a benefit. And if the townspeople reject his offer of the cistern, uh, even if the uh, or the appropriate public officials reject the offer, he now has a responsibility to guard it until he makes it safe. So he either has to cover it, or he has to refill it, etc. Um, so that's what it's contingent on. Okay, so. Um, it compares that with somebody who digs a pit and uncovered it and didn't give it over to the public. Obviously, he's liable to pay for the damage it does. 
because uh, even if he had the intent to create a uh, like a water system for the public benefit, but he didn't give them the right, um, what do you call it, public declaration or inform them, uh, he's Notice, liable yeah. for damages. There's, there's a protocol you have to follow. Um, so as far as that's concerned, obviously he's liable. And this was the practice of Nehunya, the digger of pits, ditches, and vaults. So there was a guy in the Gomorrah known as Nehunya, the digger of pits, ditches, and vaults. He used to dig pits and uncover them and give them over to the public. As, as, as a mess, uh, Gaza Zachesed, they didn't have public plumbing in those days. And that was his core expertise. And basically, when the uh, sages heard about this matter, they said, this one, referring to Nehunya, fulfilled the law. So the Gomorrah basically wonders about the Bryce's language. Did he fulfill only this law and no more laws of the Torah? Meaning, you know, you have certain people that have an affinity for one thing, like they'll keep kosher, but they won't keep Shabbos, for example, whatever. So the right. Gomorrah revises the Bryce and says, I want everybody to know that, that he fulfilled this law as well as all the others, meaning uh, he was righteous in all respects. He was especially scrupulous in fulfilling the laws pertaining to his occupation. Okay. So a related Bryce is stated, the rabbis taught in a Bryce uh, that an incident occurred with the daughter of Nehunya, the ditch digger. Uh, she basically fell in a great pit filled with water. What would you call it, guys? A well. I think you'd call it a well. And what we're mm. hoping here is Kevin would say is, did it end well? <laughs> so, Kevin. Yeah, you locked out there. All right. Sorry. <laughs> he would dig cisterns. Okay. I think it did end well. This story did end well. It actually. did end well. It does. So he, would dig, well. he would dig cisterns along the road so that there should be abundant water available for the. It, it wasn't like you just dig one. The whole focus here is that there was a, a pilgrimage basically for the three festivals that you had to make your way to Jerusalem. This is what Rashi said. And that there had to be abundant water available for those who made the pil pilgrimage. So um, there's a guy in, there's a great man in the uh, Mishnah in Shekalim, uh, chapter five, verse one, known as Nechunya, the ditch digger. And we don't know if this is the same Nechunya that was the digger of pits, ditches, and vultures. Not vultures, vaults. <laughs> <laughs> it's been a long time. <laughs> that was mentioned oh. previously. <laughs> okay. Um, so we're saying it's the same tzaddik that was mentioned. Anyway, his daughter fell in the well, and they didn't know if she would survive. So what happened is they went to uh, the great uh, uh, leader of the generation, Rav Hanina, Ben Dosa. And they, they came forth and they said, can you please pray for a rescue? So the first hour, they came and they said, have you had any feedback? Do you, have you had any like Ruach HaKodesh? And he said to them, peace, shalom. Uh, second hour, he said to them, peace. Okay. And then the third hour, he said to him, she has come up from the water. So um, Rav Hanina was correct for it. In fact, emerged safely okay so what what does this mean is why did he say peace etc after each hour because he meant that there was an, there was no concern it was possible for her to be alive under the water Rav Hanin assured the people that even if she hadn't yet emerged she would come up soon that's Rashi's explanation but unfortunately once enough time elapsed uh, at the possibility that she could surely drown if she was underwater, uh, this occurs after a period of about three hours because the word sha'ar, hour, is used loosely and some take it literally. So some <clears throat> use it as a term to denote like a short, unspecified period of time and others say it's exactly an hour. So if you're under the water for three hours, you can consider it tickets, even by Talmudic standards, okay? So uh, according to Rashi, at... Uh, uh, she, uh, Rabbi Hanina was correct for she emerged, she emerged safely from the well. Okay. They said to her, who brought you up? She replied, a male of sheep came away with a certain elderly man leading it. So guys, when you read the commentary, do you know which sheep it was? 
Yeah, I, I read it. I, I know. What is it, Gav? It's, it's the ram. It's from uh, Yitzha. Exactly. It's the Akeda. It's the ram that uh, Abraham Yitzhak. sacrificed instead of Yitzhak. Uh, that, uh, and who was the elderly man accompanying the sheep? Abraham. Abraham. And why was Abraham the person to save her? Well, firstly, I think I think the fumes got to it. That's my honest opinion. <laughs> <laughs> and I was reading it. I said, because you know, it talks about it's going to come now. I think we're going to get to it. Yeah, it's very clever. Like, very clever. So I, thought, I thought it was the fumes that got to it. Um, what is your question? Sorry, what was the last part about why was it? Why, why was it Abraham? Abraham? Uh, yeah, sure. I read it. I can't remember. Anybody remember that? Give me a just to give me a minute. So Abraham is known as the shepherd, I think. Isn't he known as the shepherd of the Jewish people? Yes, so that's exactly it. He's, he's known for two things. The fact that he he cares for his flock and he beseeches Hashem on behalf of the Jewish people. But the reason why he has merit to do so is because he believed in hospitality to guests. And uh, a person that digs a pit to make sure other Jews have water during the three festivals and many times is a person that cares about the well-being of others like Avram. And so a daughter of such a person merits to be redeemed from such a, a great uh, one of our forefathers. And they said to Rav Hanina, are you a prophet? In other words, how do you know that she was safe? Does he have Ruach HaKodesh? He replied, I'm neither, I'm neither a prophet nor the son of a prophet. But this is what I said. Can it be that something over which that righteous person, Nuhunya, was distressed for the public's sake, his child should stumble and meet her demise through it? Meaning, Medakanegedmida, just like he was concerned that people had water to drink, and by giving himself selflessly by digging cisterns for the sake of the festival pilgrims, it's inconceivable that uh, his daughter should drown in a cistern. That's according to Rashi. Okay. So um, there seems to be uh, a slight question by Rav Acha. He said, look, nevertheless, Nahunya's son died of thirst. So what's, uh, so, so what's the question then, guys? The question should be obvious to all of you. So why, why, should, why does Nahunya's son, who's a son of a tzaddik, why, why should he die? He shouldn't more, die. More importantly, all the, all why the, should he die? What did you say, yeah. Gav? Why should he die? He had the same merit as the daughter. What's the difference? Yeah. I mean, it's the same family. So if the yeah. daughter was safe, he should have been safe too. Yeah, it didn't make sense. Yeah. Okay, so so the thing of it is, if you look at it, one of one of the issues is that it's not a, it's the fact that because he was so scrupulous to make sure people had water. His daughter it didn't breaks. die through the means of water. So why should his son die of thirst when uh, Nechunya made sure that nobody else died of thirst? That's that's the weird part. Another answer. So what's the answer? It's a hairbreak. Okay, what, is, what does that mean exactly? Okay, so he was such a pious and such a tzaddik. So the only example I can think of is Rabbi Abba. We all know him. So somebody like that is judged on a hairbreak, you know, I would imagine. Okay, very good. So we're going to get to this. So uh, listen, this, the truth of it is I'm not quite sure, and I still need to find out how it answers the question that he would have died, the son of thirst, in the same manner where he had a specific um, extra measure of chesed, maybe in another area. You know what I'm saying, but that's, um, that's quite difficult to understand. I've still got. I to think follow. Damon. It's, I looked for it also, but it said that. Uh, and if he said it, but they said that Hashem doesn't look at our failings. That's what he said, and that because of that, it happened. Okay, so Nachunya uh, never said that. that we'll go through no, what that means. The son said that. Maybe, maybe the son said that. Okay, maybe so, that's why it happened. Okay, so we'll see what that means. So exactly as you guys said, because despite the fact that Nachunya toil to make water available to the public has come down of thirst. Although Rav Hanina ben Dosa considered it inconceivable that Khuna's offspring should die through the thing that we're, 
he very uh, it's the very thing that he distressed himself over that applies only to his daughter drowning in a cistern however the son died from lack of water nonetheless the punishment seems incongruous and the Gomorrah therefore finds it necessary to explain how this tragedy could have occurred that's from the Torah Sachin. okay so it's still it's still very difficult because it seems like the same sort of, sort of uh, theme that if the daughter was saved by that sort of merits uh, the son should have especially for the way he died okay so I'm gonna just sort something out now just give me one second guys um that's just give me one second. Okay. Okay. All right. So, um, guys, just give me one second. I'm just going to move the cat. Just give me one sec. It's just a problem. Just give me one second. All right, so it's near my keyboard. Apologies, guys. All right, so all right, all right, guys. So basically, it's difficult to understand. I must be honest. If the son died from a different mechanism, but not uh, the fact that he stopped everybody else from dying at first, it would be easier to understand. I, I do battle with the method that he died by. I'm sure Hashem, Hashem is righteous in all that he does. I just don't have enough information how to explain that particular one. But the thing is that it's stated uh, that uh, he was punished. Obviously, Nechunya was punished for some uh, misdeed. Why? Because nobody's perfect. And it's stated, and Hashem's surroundings are extremely turbulent. What does this mean? It's a verse in Psalms, uh, chapter 50, verse 3. And what it means is that it teaches that the Holy One, blessed is He, yeah. is exacting with those who surround Him, even to the extent of a hair's breadth, what Gavin said. So what do we mean? The term turbulent with a samach uh, means like a storm, etc. Okay, that Hashem can obviously create, if you look at Job and the uh, uh jonah and the whale and and things like that where uh people are judged or, or job that's judged very harshly and and they say he was a tzaddik and hashem tested him etc there's a word uh sar which means turbulent storm uh with the summer and then the one with the, the sin and and the one related with the sin if you interchange the letter which is the same phonetics as rav acha expounded means hair like you judge within the hair breath so he understands that God treats those who surround him, meaning the, the righteous people, exactly as, as Gavin said with Rabbi Abach, um, who cleaved him with judgment that is rigorous to the degree of his breath. How do we know? In other words, that God punishes them fully in this world, even for their minor misdeeds, so that they will be worthy of a pure reward for their righteousness in the world to come. Why is that a kindness? Yeah. Because uh, Nahunya was extremely righteous, right? And it was decreed upon him that whatever he did wrong in his life, and nobody's perfect, gets uh, cleansed in this world so that he has no compromise for eternity. And he has a full, proper ulama ba, which is eternity. So he witnessed his son's death through thirst. Uh, um, so obvi obviously there's a discussion with the Maharal, what happened. Maybe it was a test of Imuna, specifically in the area where he could have thrown it all up in the air and said, well, doesn't make sense, etc. So how, what's the lesson that we can derive from here? Rav Nechunia says, this um, lesson may be derived from here. God is dreaded in the great council of the holy and is awesome over all who surround him. So that is in Psalms 89, uh, uh, the 89th chapter, verse 8. The righteous who surround God are made to experience the awe of his judgment. Now it says, um, 
Rav Chunia says this. What's so, what's so amazing about the fact that Rav Chunia said this is this is the person who it happened to. So he accepted this. Isn't that amazing, guys, that he actually accepted it? He's the one that stated this. So, really, so guys, there's a related statement by Rav Hanina who said, anyone who said that the Holy One blessed is he is disregarding of sin, his life shall be disregarded. That's what Kevin was talking about. But it's not implying that the son said that. Uh, okay, Kev, that's just the only thing I wanted to clear up. It stated the rock is perfect fire. is all his work for all his path for justice. All it's saying <laughs> that you have certain rabbis that say that like that they want to be ingratiated in a reform or traditional community. So that uh, people will come uh, uh, Shabbos in and Shabbos out. And I'm not saying you've got to be abrasive or antagonistic because at least somebody's doing something that's better than nothing. But many yeah. times these rabbis don't say anything or, or say why well, it's good to keep Shabbos. And Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi talks about this. That, yeah. you know, there's certain people that say it's okay, God loves you no matter what you do. And it says in Kohelet that God respects somebody that fears him and does his will. That's what he wants, is that he wants you to, it's no good not conducting yourself properly and say, look, I've got a close relationship with Hashem. He's my charmer. I agree with him. I like him. But you don't, you don't have enough respect to follow his orders. What he wants, I'll give you an example. Nobody likes, if you've got your own business, and Gavin uh, experienced this, Arthur has, I'm sure Kevin has in his own business, is you don't want the people that work for you to get too chummy with you. They're not your friends. Yeah, yeah. So I said to this, uh, this guy that worked for me in Brume, he came out, he said, you know, sorry, mate, I had traffic problems. I said, you know what? I'm not your mate. You work for me. Keep it up and you'll work somewhere else. I said, don't take me as a joke <laughs> just because I've been friendly. I said, you're overstepping boundaries. You mistake arms me for, length, arms length, eh? for, work, uh, for weakness. I said, I'm not weak. I said, you will go in a heartbeat if you take advantage of me. I said, I'm not your friend. I want to be friendly because I believe in a nice working, but I'm not your friend. And, uh, and Hashem doesn't like it when people uh, see him as his chai. Is its father is the king. Okay. And you have to stand up when your father works in the room. By citing that God ignores whatever misdeeds a person does, what happens is this person, as Rabbi Yosef Mizrahi says, he incites people to sin because he approves of their behavior or certainly doesn't condemn it. And therefore, he's going to get punished in Shemaim for, for when the good do nothing, uh, the bad can uh, continue with their bad behavior. It's according to Rashi. So when God uh, disregards all misdeeds, or he disregards some of them, uh, that's not the case. Because it says in, uh, in Deuteronomy chapter 32, verse 4, although God is compassionate and forgiving of our sin, he employs his attributes within the parameters of justice. Okay? For example, if somebody's wicked, Maybe they don't realize what they're doing. They haven't developed a sensitivity. He wants to delay punishment because he wants everybody to make a, a proper repentance, a proper teshuva, and he wants to forgive those who repent. But he never disregards a person's action because that's not justice. Disregarding an evil act would be as inappropriate for God as disregarding a meritorious act. There has to be justice. Um, so what happens is, as we've learned in Sota, uh, which we were learning with Rav Simcha Soundhauer, sometimes you get small messages of clubs. What do I mean? I'll give you an example. You have somebody that's wealthy and arrogant, <coughs> and then they go through a financial reversal, or somebody that's super healthy and has never stopped uh, to help an elderly person or whatever, because they don't know what it is to feel bad physically, or they're extremely bright, and they're narcissistic, and they don't know what it is to struggle with intellectual capacity, to struggle grasping concepts, etc. So these people sometimes are giving a reversal of fortune to have a sensitivity to others. Now, it's not a punishment. What it is, is a way to be able to help them repent in this world by basically seeing it from the other point of view. Because if you can't see it from the other point of view, one is not insensitive. I remember Arthur saying to me on, on Friday or Thursday night, which is quite something, is that as a result of working 
with older people. He was in a shopping center and this woman that was struggling to walk couldn't get a trolley. And the people that were around her, she was asking for help or indicating she needed help. And they didn't give two hoots. They didn't care. They were young and healthy. And Arthur, because he hasn't had the best health in his life, and he's walking, uh, working uh, with elderly people. Guys, I don't know where my tongue is tonight. Sorry. Um, after a bit of uh, glucose, my blood sugar gets better. But I need to have glucose first. So anyway, Arthur helped this woman. Why? Because he works with people. He knows when they're struggling. And this is the sort of sensitivity. And anybody that's gone through a financial setback appreciates appreciates everything that's given to uh, them. There was a case called affluenza. Affluenza is a case where somebody has so much, they don't appreciate anything and they think everybody is there just to serve them. That's detrimental to the soul. So, you know, they name it affluenza for the word affluent, meaning wealthy, and influenza, meaning it'll kill you. You think it's good for you, but it's bad for you. And so to Hashem judges with the, his... Uh, uh, breath. Okay. So, uh, what you should know is it stated Hashem, the rock, perfect is his work for all his paths of justice. So, the Rav Chana and some say Rav Shmuel Ban Nachmani. What is the meaning of that which is written? Um, do you remember when we say Erech HaPayim? Do you remember what we say on, uh, uh, on the festivals and on Rosh Hashanah? Kevin, do you remember that, uh, that phrase? Yeah. It's a Hashem Hashem Kel Rachem Vachan on Erech Apayim Barav Chesed Vemet. That's thirteen attributes of faith. Exactly. Hashem Hashem Martin Compassion and Gracious, slow to anger, abundant in kindness and truth. Exactly as Kevin said, except that Kevin knows how to say it properly in Hebrew. I need a siddur. So it's it comes from Shmuel chapter thirty four verse six. Okay. And and what does it mean? It's interesting because the word Erech Apayim. What does Paim mean, guys? Erecha Paim? Ponim is, is face. So slow in faces. What does it mean that Hashem is slow to anger? It doesn't mean slow to anger. Actually, the literal meaning means slow to faces. Okay? Patient. Well, what does a face do? A face reflects your feelings towards another. If somebody looks yeah. really, a face reflects if a person has disdain for you or love for you. It's a mirror of the soul. It's a mirror of the emotions. So what it's saying is here is Hashem shows faces to people. What does that actually mean? Well, it means the following. Is that he's abundant in kindness and truth. And Hashem is slow in showing his face to the wicked in anger. And meeting our punishment for their misdeeds. So the wicked look at this and think, great, I got away with it. But if somebody's sensitive, they turn around and say, Hashem is slow to anger and doesn't show his angry face because he wants me to make the sugar. Okay, but it doesn't say slow in face singular, erech af. It says erech apayim, which is faces. So why faces? Because God is slow in faces, plural. He's slow to show his displeasure to the wicked, and he's, show, he's slow to show his pleasure to the righteous. Why? Well, both these characteristics stem from his mercy. Because why? He 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 does is slow to reward the righteous because he doesn't want them to get the Ferrari the minute they do a mitzvah, because then they're gonna do it for in order to get benefits in this world. He Hashem in his greatness wants to reserve his reward for the world to come for the righteous. So it looks like they're suffering in this world because they're getting through the punishments of the mistakes they've made in this world, so they can have an eternity of bliss. And he delays the punishment of the wicked meaning he's slow to show them his anger until the world to come, so they have the opportunity to repent before they die. So obviously the wicked that don't repent is a problem. It's detrimental. They're going to uh, forfeit their share in the world to come. Are they, are they in full or in qualitatively? That's for sure. Okay? So that's why it's not written erech af, but erech uh, In In other words, slow in faces, not slow in face. So God is, uh, is slow to show a jubilant face to the righteous. In other words, he delays reward, uh, uh, for the world to come. And he's slow in showing his angry face to the wicked. He delays their punishment for the world to come to give them a chance to repent. He doesn't want to punish them. 
So the Gemara returns to the subjects of obstacles in the public domain. Uh, the rabbis taught in the Bryce, a person may not clear stones from his own domain into the public domain. Okay, so there was an incident that was related with a certain person. He was clearing stones from his own domain into the public domain. And there was a certain pious person that found him doing this. And he said to him, empty one, meaning the guy didn't have a brain in his head. He was saying to this guy, why are you clearing stones from a domain that is not yours into a domain that is yours? Okay, so this guy didn't understand what he was saying. He scoffed at the pious person. Okay, but what he was saying is as follows. Is that the property that you now own may not be yours tomorrow because there's a wheel of fortune. Sometimes what you've got today, you lose tomorrow. Whereas the public domain will always be available for your use. That's according to Rashi. Okay. And what, he, what, uh, what, what happened then is in a couple of uh, uh, weeks later or days later, he needed to sell this field. And he was walking in the public domain. I'm sure it was a few days later, as the Gomorrah said, because otherwise he wouldn't have remembered this incident so well. And he tripped over those stones. Um, fittingly, did the pious person tell me, uh, why are you clearing stones from a domain that is not yours into a domain that's yours? So um, it's, just, it's just a good life lesson, guys. All right, listen, I don't want to, I don't want to hit the new Mishnah. Um, I want to thank you for uh, attending. Thanks, Damon. Thanks for accommodating me. And Pleasure. Us and, uh, no. no, and me. And Arthur. And Pleasure. Arthur. All right. And, and Arthur. And Kets. Uh, the Rosh uh, uh, Hashiva. Talmud and Chochem, the Rosh Hashiva. Uh, yes, when is Rabbi Cohen coming? When is Rabbi Cohen coming? <laughs> I agree. No, we're talking about you, Damon. You're oh, very modern. He's a He's a Mashiach. But listen, we're going to start a, a what's it called? A, Gavin, a, 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 I'm better be careful. Start there. moving outside, Gavin. I'm on my way now. Okay. Yeah, All right, let me start away. Yes. I'm sorry. Can you give me 10 minutes or not? No, no, no. It's going to be too late otherwise. Come on. We've got other one. I've got to put shoes on and Gavin, look my like, You know, he looks like Damon. You know, the band of Aces, the, Liam, the lead singer, Liam Gallagher. Uh, they haven't cut okay. my hair yet. He looks like you know the band of Aces, Damon. Yes, he looks like Liam Gallagher. The Beatles. Oh, one of them. Oh, one of them. Exactly. Well, they copied them. Gavin, come back to me. Gavin. All right. All right, guys, go. I know you have a. I know you need to go. But listen, I enjoyed the gadata. It was nice to have a bit of a gadata between the intellectual acrobatics. It was fun. Yeah. It was important. Okay, cool. I just did. Cheers, guys.